It's the vibrator that has no equal. And now, Motor Bunny offers their thrusting sex machine, the Motor Bunny Buck. Enjoy a Man Whore podcast discount on any of their products with promo code BILLY40 at MotorBunny.com. The Man Whore podcast is sponsored by Alt Playground. APG is more than just a place to find couples to swap with. Alt Playground is a lifestyle community for all non-monogamous and sexually adventurous people to connect and share. And you know I started a profile. Join me over at altplayground.net. That's A-L-T playground.net. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. A PSA to all you oral enthusiasts, hygiene horn dogs, and kissing connoisseurs, no. Mouthwash is not the secret to making out with people during COVID. <sighs> This is a very frustrated Billy Presida, and you are listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Oi, we'll get to that in a moment. Everybody, this week, oh gosh, so excited. It's finally happened. We have finally got on the resurrected porn star, adult entertainment's phoenix risen from the ashes. We have on my one-time former Team BJ co-star, Siri Dahl is on the podcast this week, and oh gosh, can't wait to share it with you on a little bit. We'll also be hearing uh, from the organizers of the Lesbian Bar Project, uh, but first let me just briefly, real briefly, address the mouthwash thing. Look, what did we say two weeks ago when I had on the fabulous Dr. Justin Laymiller? We talked about uh, when you see a headline of any article and it says, new study suggests, take it with the entire container of salt. We said, read the actual article. We said, if you can, actually read a little bit of the study if possible. Yes, there was a study done uh, recently uh, trying to see if there were over-the-counter products that might eliminate uh, COVID-19 from, say, a patient's saliva. They were trying to see if there's anything that's kind of like already available that's out there that might kill the virus. And they found some evidence that mouthwashes with a certain ingredient in them might eliminate the virus from a patient's saliva. Why is this not an excuse to all start doing mouthwash shots before we make out with our new Tinder date? Here's why. One, the study, they didn't even use the actual SARS virus that causes COVID-19. They used a similar virus for that particular study okay um this study was not done on humans this is not considered a human study and the the study itself not peer reviewed okay not a peer reviewed study more study needs to be happened there's actually a, an upcoming clinical trial at the university hospital of wales that's going to actually examine this more in actual patients but no i just want to be clear doing shots of mouthwash has not been proven to eliminate COVID-19 from your saliva. I know we're horny. I know we're restless, but this one's not the answer. Okay, cool. Got it. Great. I've got a link in the show notes. If you want to read more, even though I know people don't enjoy reading very much, but here's something I think we can all enjoy very much. Lesbian bars, right? And some really wonderful people are putting together a crowdfunding campaign to save the few remaining lesbian bars in the United States. Uh, it's called the Lesbian Bar Project, and they are raising money and dividing the monies up uh, to send out to all the bars that are struggling right now during the pandemic. And honestly, we're probably struggling before the pandemic too. So let's learn a little bit more about the Lesbian Bar Project with uh, representatives Lily and Charles. All right, uh, and I am here right now with Lily and Charles from the Lesbian Bar Project, uh, who has a, they have a very noble cause right now, to save the remaining lesbian bars in this country while small businesses everywhere are struggling uh, you know, during this pandemic. Lily and Charles, uh, thanks for joining me. Yeah, hi, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, happy to be here. Yeah, so um, why don't you all tell us a little bit just about the Lesbian Bar Project? I saw this tweeted and I was like, 
you know, I'm a big cubby hole stan as, as fans of the show know. So to know that there's like, oh God, there are more cubbies out there and they're struggling. We got it. We got to save them. So, so what's the Lesbian Bar Project? Yeah, so Lesbian Bars have been struggling for a long time, but when COVID hit, we all knew the service industry was really going to be struggling, and we know that losing even one more of these sacred queer spaces is just not an option. It has a really negative effect on our community when we don't have space, and because a lot of these places are owned by women, there is a gender bias in our country and there there isn't as much access to the finances that they need. And for a variety of reasons, these bars have been struggling. So we wanted to do something. And what we did was create a branded PSA. It's about 90 seconds long. And we kind of pay tribute to some bars that have closed. And we talk about what we can do to save them and respect them. We have executive producer Leah Delaria signed on and she did a gorgeous voiceover for us. And now we have lesbianbarproject.com where you can give donations and we split it between these bars. And are, not, are anyone, uh, are any of y'all bar owners? So no, actually we're all community members and our patrons, but none of us are owners or have any, uh, anything to gain from this opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fully philanthropic. We're in touch with all of the bar owners, which has been really beautiful. But yeah, we're all filmmakers, storytellers, theater makers. So our way in to help this cause was making a piece of film content and creating a website and gathering these testimonials and stories from the real bar owners. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And 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 how did y'all uh, know each other to come together to do that? Were, were, are you all friends or are you all part of different uh, communities that have a local lesbian bar or how, how'd that come about? Well, we're all New Yorkers. And ah. Charles, yeah, um, <laughs> Charles met my roommate, Erica, in what what show was it on charles you were working together uh, on some worked, film project yeah we worked on the first season of billions together and hit it off and became best buds and then <laughs> uh lily and erica lived together and have been were roommates for i think seven or eight years and then oh my god yes. um, <laughs> Alina, who was the other co-director um she's a fellow filmmaker and she and erica got connected and became friends and so we kind of all just came together to to put this together and to put it out there. Now, is it true that there's only 15 lesbian bars left in the country? Ooh, um, actually, since launching, we have had a few more bars come out of the woodwork. Oh, thank God. I thought you were going to say more closed. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Well, uh, huh. oh, now it's down no, to no, nine. No, no, no. <laughs> We've, it's uh, down to just Cubby. No, no, no. I mean, God forbid, no. We God have... forbid it was only Cubby that was open. No one yeah. would fit. Well, also, anyone that's been to Cubby, it's so tiny. Like, yeah. we literally need more space. <laughs> Um, no, we've had a couple more bars. Um, co- the patrons from other cities and other towns have been coming forward and saying, hey, this is my lesbian bar. Why isn't it included? And the answer is we did six months of research and we could not find these spaces. And to me, that's a part of the problem. I should know where these bars are. It's I'm invested in it. I want to support them. I want to love them. I want to uplift them. So the awareness raising side of the campaign is also really important to us. So we're in the midst as a team of figuring out how how we're going to add these bars to the website in the long term. Is this website going to keep being updated as new bars open? And we have a lot of possibilities in that respect. Now, is that, does that have anything to do with like maybe, uh, you know, in, in certain big cities, you can search lesbian bar and you find the one or two that are there. But, you know, if you're in Kansas, it's not that they're like hiding it, but like locals know it's a lesbian bar, but they're not like broadcasting. that. Is that like an element at all? I think it's a mixture, to be honest with you, Um, because even as we were researching from New York to find these spaces around the country, if they're not popping up on Google or if they're not popping up in a way that we can, you know, get the expression or get the information, then they are a bit hidden. And everyone that's reached out to us has been from that specific city, whether it's in Phoenix or Virginia or what have you that they're already aware because that's their home bar or that's where they go. Um, and so it's the mixture of uh, maybe they don't have as many like, you know, geo tags or what have you online or in that search space, but also um, the way they identify or how they put themselves out to the public is a, a, is a factor that comes into play as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Um, and, and so Lily, so how many are we up to now? How, how many have come out the woodwork? <laughs> well, that's, that's the question is we're, we're doing research. We're reaching out to the actual owners of the bars because mostly it's been patrons going, Hey, you left out my favorite bar. So uh, we're, we're in the 17 to 19 range right now. It's still under 20, um, which is sad, but I mean, honestly, when we started this project in, a- late April, early May, there were 16 lesbian bars, and already one of those is not going to be able to reopen. Um, so we went 16 down to 15, and now the fact that we're bumping up is like really exciting. Julie from Pearl Bar in Houston and Kathy Jack from Sue Ellen's in Dallas are not taking part in the crowdfunding portion specifically to make room for the bars that are struggling in a more dire way. So the fact that they made that choice makes us more excited to like really be blowing up these other bars and and give them more attention because some of these bars are not struggling in a way that they are like, we need this money right now. And some of them really are. So there's a whole variety of stories to be told. Mm -hmm. And it's not that like, you know, queer bars are like even like more predominantly like gay male bars. It's not that like they don't struggle at all, but there really just are so much fewer really lesbian bar spaces. Um, What's the what's the different like what's the extra struggle of it being a lesbian bar? Um, Mm, Right. I mean, I don't want to get into like too controversial a territory, but when we think about gentrification in a neighborhood, who is it affecting? Usually people of a lower income who tends to have a lower income because of wages. It tends to be women, assigned female at birth people, people of color. So there are just added challenges when we're talking about a gender specific space. Um, I, I think that's part of it. Uh, Not to get into another sort of controversial topic, but we've gotten some weird emails from transphobic women, transphobic lesbians who are really turfy and saying, well, I know the reason is because these bars are safe for trans people and trans people, la la la, you know, yeah, despicable. And to clarify, Lesbian Bar Project is only in support of lesbian bars that are trans inclusive. That is our official mission and statement. And anyone that thinks that having, I mean, a queered identity in terms of gender is something that's a problem for lesbian culture. Like we have no space for that in our project. And, you know, that's, that's kind of our official stance, but I think there are a lot of problems. It's not just gentrification. It's that when you look at the numbers and this is specifically from bar owners, we've been in touch with men or cis men tend to drink more in quotation marks, or there's like there, these bars might be more cash cows. They're making more money when it's a more cis gay male space. I I don't know. I haven't seen that or experienced that. I've been a bartender, so I don't think it always does depend on gender. What so someone is drinking and how much they're drinking. Um, but I think one of the problems is that these spaces have ha- have had to adapt in a really big way. I think the lesbian community and lesbian culture has changed a lot even since the 90s. And hopefully the spaces that we're trying to uplift are really pivoting to feed the needs of the contemporary current queer community. So what is, what's like your personal um, attachment to these uh, queer nightlife spaces. Maybe what were one of your first introductions, especially both as New Yorkers? You know, what were some of your first experiences uh, going to bars like this? Lily, do you want to go first? Oh my god, it's an <laughs> endless story. I love nightlife. I'm crazy for it. Honestly, I Charles and I have like a plan to go to a park and play music and just like dance. <laughs> Uh, And I've done that a little bit on my own because what I miss more than anything is the dancing. Uh, Anyone that has been to Stonewall on a Friday night, that is like the kind of lesbian queer space upstairs. And I mean, I've met partners I've loved on that dance floor. Like it's, it's a really important element for me. And certainly I've gone on a million dates at Cubby Hole um, gingers because I'm a I live in Brooklyn, so gingers is like really important to me, and I've spent many a New Year's Eve there. Um, and actually, I'm really sad because we're we've talked a little bit about lesbian bars, but I'm thinking of going to Pride in Hell's Kitchen, and it's like that's that's such an important part, and already a couple of those gay bars have closed, and it's like ugh, I can't I can't even think about it. Like it's really really upsetting. 
my connection or, you know, how I got into this or these spaces, I am a gay man. And so I like to go into spaces where I feel safe and comfortable and welcomed for just me, not because I look a certain way or because, you know, someone wants someone something from me. Um, I've had my own experiences in Cubbyhole and enjoyed it, but also felt a little bit like this is, a, I'm respectful of the space because this is for my lesbian sisters but I don't necessarily mm-hmm. need to be there unless there's something going on or someone invites me because I don't know. I think that we as men can sometimes like go into spaces that are not catering to us and then feel, you know, offended because we're not being catered to. Um, and I don't think that that's the point. I think it's about preserving these safe spaces for other portions or other aspects of our community. Um, as Lily mentioned, like transphobia is not okay. And we're welcoming and inclusive of everyone that identifies under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella. And it's important for me to be a part of this. And in this is because we need allies. I mean, as Lily said, you know, the groups of people that tend to be lower income or have these different like economic disparities are women and are people of color and, you know, those spaces are being impacted as well. And so it's about joining the fight together and saving our spaces together so that we can all have somewhere, whether we're commingling or not commingling, somewhere to feel safe and somewhere to let our hair down and just be who we are. Yeah, and I got to imagine that those experiences have been so different in those types of spaces than, say, you know, Second Avenue at the 13th step or something like that, right? It's like... Crazy you would say that because when I broke up with my boyfriend in the Air Force when I was like 20, that was where I took my first lesbian date. And what the hell is wrong with me? I was, oh my God. I mean, I was 21. I was not 20. I was 21. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I was uh, dumb. I didn't understand. And But yeah, exactly. Don't go there as a lesbian. <laughs> I do want to say... <laughs> To to Charles's point about like his involvement, just like such a shout out to Charles, the other it's like a four person lesbian bar project team and three of us are a fab like women adjacent folks and Charles is our wonderful male ally and his his input has been so important and honestly feeling support from men is really important because a lot of times gay men and gay women don't get that happening and to have that on our team is like incredibly invaluable to our process. Mm -hmm. And now uh, totally. And then to to that point, you know, I think people sometimes think a lesbian bar, sometimes even gay bars, something like that, as if like, well, I don't identify that way. I can't even go there. And like, I, so why would I even be supporting this? And Cubby, particularly for me, even Stonewall and like basically any gay bar I've gone to, I have felt the most fucking accepted than anywhere I've gone, mm. uh, any type of bar. It was Cubby Hole. My relationship to it started off as just like I had a old babysitter who decided who realized that she's lesbian, and I was like the only one nearby who could go to Cubby with her. Uh, so I basically went and I babysat, and like I would sit at the bar with like the old the older butch chicks, and then like she would go off like making out with half the bar. It's like you do you. <laughs> Honestly, maybe a little too aggressively, because sometimes the friends would come up to me. Hey, you know, you're great. You're sweet. Can you leave your friend at home? But like you oh come back. Anytime. <laughs> but, oh, um, <laughs> but, but you know, even like five, six years ago, I remember I went out to get drinks with like um, uh, some podcasters, these two women and like their significant others. And one of them, like I'm polyamorous, I'm not monogamous. And they mm-hmm. like took an affront to that. One of, mm. one of these women and like and she had a, a few too many maybe and then started like really being belligerent and like really started making me feel terrible about mm. the way i live and love my life mm-hmm. um and i i kind of at one point i just called it i was like you know what I, i'm gonna go because this is making me uncomfortable so i leave it happened to be i didn't even put this together but i happened to be a few blocks from cubby and i'm just walking i i, I happened to pass it and i thought you know what i'm gonna go in i'm mm. gonna have a drink and I went in there and I was like sullying and I was kind of like in the corner. I was trying to be by myself and like have a beer and just like come down. And like people came over to me and they were like, oh, you OK? You look oh. sad. Let's dance. I felt so included there in a space where, I mean, again, look at me. Like, do I look like I'm the person Cubby's excited to have? 
No, but that's they. Everyone <laughs> is welcome there if you're not a fucking dick. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and, and and it's a beautiful space. And and so to find out there were more spaces like that closing even before Corona, you know, uh, yeah. always made me sad. And so I was so happy to see that y'all um, put this together. Mm. To your point, uh, though, Billy, about you feeling the most accepted in these spaces, I think that that's a really huge thing to touch on because. You know, I think you, you're you getting that kind of recognition and acceptance because everyone in that space has been somewhere and has not been accepted. Mm-hmm. Everyone mm-hmm. in that space has had an experience where they've had to either, you know, defend themselves or internally, you know, define who they are and n- not be ashamed of it and still believe that they're deserving of love and valuable as a person. And so I've, because you talked about like your first moment in Cubby and like, It can be turfy. It can be a little, depending on what you're going in there for. Like I've had, I've been into Cubby and even though I was with a group of mixed company friends, I'll say, um, I got some stares and I was like, it's okay. I understand like this isn't my space or like, but I'm also not going to come in and be belligerent. But, Mm -hmm. and I don't know that everyone that, you know, identifies as heterosexual or wherever they are on the spectrum knows that that is a possibility. Um, I think overall, we just have to be open to each other because we're people and we have different thoughts and beliefs. And, uh, you know, I do think that going into like lesbian spaces or gay spaces, it becomes this sense of like, yeah, we all want to be free. We all want to be equal because we're not being treated equal in the world that we live in versus, Mm -hmm. you know, someone just being able to kind of walk and be who they are without those restrictions. But but again, it's like Charles, as, as men, especially cisgender men walk going into a space like that, you go like, there's an inherent respect we have to have for the space. Exactly. And I think some people, if they get some weird stares and they're not cognizant of what that space is and what it means to the people they're surrounded by, mm-hmm. they think that person's just staring at me or they hate straight people or they hate this. It's like, no, like, make me, like, it's okay if you got some bad stairs because they get a thousand more bad stairs outside of that one space. Exactly. Um, and I will also say, I don't think it's cool if like a guy walked into a lesbian bar and everyone starts shouting at him to get the fuck out. Right. But if he walks in and starts being a dickhead and belligerent and trying to shove his way to the bar, like he deserves to be there before anyone else. Yeah. Now let's shit because, because that has nothing to do with gender. That's just someone being a dick and I don't care how you identify being a dick. Never cool. Yeah. And it's all about the respect. Like, even if as a gay man going into a lesbian bar, it's about the respect. Like this space isn't necessarily like created for me, but they're allowing me to be here and they're welcoming. So let me just be thoughtful and respectful of their space to make sure that, you know, there aren't, there aren't any problems because <laughs> there doesn't need to be. Um, and yeah. And as the most privileged person on this call right now, it's like, I think just, we don't, we're not taught to think that, a space is like has those types of purposes because mm-hmm. every space we walk through mm-hmm. is pretty hunky dory. Ding ding ding. Yes. Generally speaking, not <laughs> per person, everybody settle down. It's not you, the lowercase w white person, right. it's capital W white people, right? So, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not that I'm like walking through a bar apologetically, but rather just trying to be respectful of the space while having a damn good time. Yeah, I think it's, it's as simple as before you walk into a space, just have the sentence in your mind, like, this is a special safe space mm-hmm. for a lot of people. And as long as that's in your mind, like, you're not going to harm people. Like, you've mm-hmm. made a commitment to yourself that you know it's sacred to the people who are already there. Uh, so so before we go, what are the fu- what what's the list? Can you give us a list of, like, the bars and where they are? Because there, there might be people who don't even realize they had a lesbian bar kind of new. Yeah. Charles, I'm going to make you do it from memory, right? <laughs> no, I, I'm going to do it. down if you're ready. <laughs> oh, um, no, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs> so you can, you can learn more about all of these wonderful 15 bars at lesbianbarproject.com. Those bars are A League of Her Own or Aloho in Washington, D.C. Blushing what a great Blue. name. Yes, I'm going to interrupt yes. with the names possible. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Blush and Blue in Denver, Cute. Colorado. We have Cubby Hole in Woo! Manhattan in New York. Henrietta Hudson, Love, Love, Love in Manhattan in New York. 
We have hers in Mobile, Alabama. We Ooh. found this bar sort of like right before we were starting to launch. The owner, Rachel, is so incredible. And this bar has only been open a year. So we love, love, love hers in Mobile. We need to support them. We have Ginger's in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. We have Gossip Grill in San Diego, California. Lipstick Lounge in Nashville, Tennessee. My Sister's Room, often called MSR. Ooh. Ooh. Whoa. Yeah. A, yeah. MSR scandalous. in Atlanta, Georgia. Pearl Bar in Houston, Texas. Slammers in Columbus, Ohio. Sue Ellen's in Dallas, Texas. Toasted Walnut in Philly. Walker's Pint in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. And Wild Rose in Seattle, Washington. Fabulous, fabulous. Lily, Charles, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me, for uh, share, sharing a bit about yourselves. Hopefully one day we'll be meeting at a Ginger's or a Cubby and, and being able to, to share a drink in person. Y'all two seem lovely. Yes. Well, yeah, thank you so much. For having us. Thank you. Me, myself, I donated $75 because I figured, hey, if I walked into any of these bars and they had a little jar saying, hey, we're struggling, you got five extra bucks, I'd give them five bucks. So I gave each bar five bucks. That was my... That's my contribution. Uh, One other thing is uh, that they forgot to mention is that the Lesbian Bar Project is having a couple of virtual events, a couple of virtual fundraising events that you can enjoy. Uh, One is on November 22nd. It's an event featuring special guest Leah Delaria from Orange is the New Black, Rosie O'Donnell, yeah, and Roxanne Gay author of Bad Feminist. And then there's also going to be a comedy, virtual comedy show on November 23rd, hosted by the Diking Out Podcast. Ooh, remember Carolyn Bergier, past man who are podcast guest? She'll be hosting the thing. Former guest of the show, Emma Willman, she'll be on the show. A lot of other really funny comics. You can find out more about those events in the same place you can donate, lesbianbarproject.com. After you've supported lesbian bars across the country, hey, maybe you got a few shekels left over to support your favorite man whore with a heart of gold. What's up? Let's do a quick fan whore appreciation moment. Shout outs to John Newton, plumber extraordinaire. Hey, uh, ladies, fellas, whatever genders he's into. Hey, I bet he can unclog your pipes. Oh, (laughs) thanks for being a member, buddy. And a thank you to Sarah Quambra Morgado. Ooh, I think this is our first official fan whore from Portugal. I know I get downloads in Portugal, but I think this is the first time we're getting some dollars and getting a couple emails from there. Thanks for supporting the podcast. Thanks for being a fan. I'm also happy to see that some of y'all are enjoying the deep discount. Ooh, the the ambiguous black period of time event. Okay, yeah, right now, if you join up for an annual membership, instead of paying month to month... You're going to get a 15% discount. That's about that's almost two months off your Patreon membership. That offer expires after November 30th. So if you've been considering being a member and you love a good deal, join up today at patreon.com slash podcast. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash podcast. And now for this week's guest, Siri Dahl. Oh, gosh. So... Just a little bit of backstory. Many of y'all know, I'm sure by now, that uh, I once upon a time did a little porno called Team BJ2 with Sarah J and Siri way, way back then. Sarah J was on the podcast episode 22. You can hear more about Team BJ2 uh, over there. And not that long afterwards, Siri retired from porn. Many of us were sad. Many of us downtrodden. And then late last year, early this year, We find out, we see on the interwebs, Siri is back and she has risen from the ashes, from her pornographic ashes. She has uh, returned as as an adult entertainment phoenix. She is now Siri Dahl, spelled D-A-H-L. She's even got her own podcast now called After Adult, and I was so thrilled that we were able to get her on the show. So let's go listen in to what it's like to leave porn and then return to porn on your own terms with Siri Dahl. The Man Whore Podcast is thrilled to be sponsored by altplayground.net, the place to go for your next non-monogamous adventure. Although with, uh, you know, cases going up around the country, it's it's where you're going to go to start planning your next non-monogamous adventure. I might recommend you all hold off on execution for a little bit, 
But that's the great thing about APG is they are making it so easy to connect with like-minded people in the lifestyle virtually. Yeah. My favorite feature is something called the big wall. And the big wall each day has like a new theme and then users get to post some sexy pictures that fit the theme. Sometimes it's a color. Sometimes it's a sex act. I'm still waiting for them to make, you know, puppetry of the penis a theme so we can really have a good time in there. Whether you're swingers, you're poly, you're a single slut, you're a couple that just wants to do a little swapping, hot wife, cuckolding, looking for a daddy dom or some sort of general non-monogamy, altplayground.net is the place for you. Come join me over there today at altplayground.net. They're even offering a special trial run. I think it's uh, you get four days for $3.99 just to test the waters out a bit. So come on by altplayground.net. When you're done listening to this episode with Siri Doll, gosh, you are going to want to probably binge watch all of her porn, everything she's been in, I'm sure. And I know one website that happens to have Oh, so many of her studio films from Reality Kings, Brazzers, Vivid, and more. And that's HotMovies.com. Yes, HotMovies.com is a pay-per-minute porn site. And that makes it a more ethical and affordable way to hashtag pay for some of your porn. And they license content from all of your favorite porn stars, all your favorite porn studios, with all your favorite porn categories. They got straight porn, queer porn, kinky porn, bisexual porn. They got it all and oh boy, do they have a lot of Siri doll. Hotmovies.com is going to give you 20 free minutes on top of any package you sign up for. Yes, that includes the free trial. And you can sign up today at Hotmovies.com. Use promo code MANHOR with any package you sign up for. And then you can go, uh, you know, enjoy it. Luscious Lesbians Exploring Siri or another uh, acutely titled film, Sirius, spelled S-I-R-I, you got it. Okay. Hotmovies.com, promo code manhor. Let's go chat with Siri. Welcome, Siri Doll. Uh, and I guess welcome back to the biz. As it seems to be Thank your you. you picked a great time to come back. Feel, feel I like, did, yeah. <laughs> you should, I, I think you should have either waited a year or done it a year sooner. Uh, because you just got back into porn like right before everything hit the fan. I had January and February. Before COVID hit, yeah. was it was it a good January and February? Because that might it was be a all fantastic. You- <laughs> two months. <laughs> what was like? What's what's your feeling when like things are locking down? Did you think this is going to be short term? Do you think this is going to be long? Are you worried about you know the the career? I was I was worried at first in March, and then I stopped worrying when I when April rolled around, and I realized that April was my best month ever on OnlyFans. <laughs> I was like, okay, everyone's at home bored. Like, it kind of makes sense in a way. But like, porn has always been said to be fairly recession proof. And like, apparently also it's fairly pandemic proof uh, is was what I've found. So and I, I'm also saying that from a pretty privileged place of being like a more well known model. Mm. Um, but yeah, like, I, I don't know, like, since I'm out way the fuck out in Kentucky when I'm like at home, I it's not like I'm surrounded by other porn performers. So it's mm-hmm. like I'm kind of used to being limited when I'm at home and what I can do anyway. So to me, it didn't actually make a huge difference. It just meant that I couldn't have any trips out to L.A. for a while. But I definitely was like, man, like I just made my big comeback and like I want <laughs> to shoot more for all these big companies, but I can't, you know. Right. So. It was. It's kind of cool to see how uh, a lot of the big studios have started to, um, and I, a lot of them are back to shooting now. But uh, back in the spring and the early summer, a lot of the companies were doing um, home shoot scenes where they'd hire models. So I did like a couple home shot scenes for browsers, and I did some for adult time. So technically, I was still working professionally. Like doing stuff that wasn't just for OnlyFans. Mm. Yeah, and home shot that is that the stuff where it's like you're shooting from home, but like someone's on Zoom or on a phone directing you. Because I saw like uh, <laughs> adult time, we're doing these like lesbian orgy scenes, but like everyone's in their own camera, and someone no, was directing. I actually never did like a Zoom party scene. Like people were like, "Oh, are you gonna do one?" And I was like, "I don't know." Like I'm so detached from the industry. Like people, or, so, whoever organizes these, like they didn't invite me. <laughs> I don't know. Like, which is fine. It seems like kind of, I don't know, like, I'm not sure that I would have been like super into it. Again, I don't, I don't know, tried it. So what is a home shot scene? 
so essentially, like, Brazzers gave me a script the way that they would give uh, a director a script. And they just said, like, here's what we want. Here's the, like, the specs that we need for your video and your photo and, like, all this stuff. And just here's the intro that we want you to shoot. Here are the positions we'd like to see you do. And yeah. <laughs> just shoot your scene. And then they just gave me a flat, like, budget for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, did, like, did you, do you get, like, a little extra since you kind of also got a direct or? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's higher paid than just being a performer because it's like you are doing literally all the work uh, okay. on your own. And that makes sense. And actually, still, they're saving a shit ton of money because, like, even mm-hmm. just paying me to do everything. And even, like, my boyfriend performed in that scene with me. So it's like they're paying two performer rates. And then they're paying extra on top of it because we're essentially also the crew for everything. And even all of that being said and done, that scene probably still cost Brazzers like less than half as much as a regular scene because it's still like much less of a crew involved. You, th- you think they'll still do this like in a post-vaccine world? Do you still think they'll they'll do that realizing they can cut some costs? Is is Mike Quasar in trouble? That's just all I'm concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, companies like Browsers, I don't think so. Because, I mean, their bread and butter is, like, their... They have a very specific brand. And, and like, it was cool that they had me do the, like, home shot thing. But I can't recreate what Browsers does in my own house. Like, there's no way. Like, the angles that they get and, like, the way that things are shot and it's all fucking cartoonish. And, like, I just can't achieve that production quality in my house <laughs> with my <laughs> iPhone. And they know that. So, like... I don't think they'll be a company that regularly does that. But I do think some companies will actually consider doing more remote content that way because it does save them money, you know. And if Mm. there's a model who lives out in the middle of nowhere like me, Mm. which is more and more common these days, it kind of makes it a little more easy. Why why do you think that is getting to be more common? I, I mentioned when we were off mic, like Venus was on here a few years ago talking about, yeah, me, we're gonna go out to Tennessee and make a queer utopia performers out there have a little nub like what what's that about uh honestly only fans just internet so the the rise of performers having more of the power in the industry being able to create and sell directly our own content makes a massive difference like i i was a little bit worried when i decided to return to porn because i was like man like i look different now i'm older like i have all this st- so much has changed and like, is the industry going to welcome me back? Are these big companies even going to want to hire me again? And as soon as I started doing like OnlyFans and like Snapchat and just all the private socials, basically, um, I was like, Oh, I guess I don't really care if those companies hire me. Like (laughs) who needs them? I don't, I don't need it in terms of, you know, it's nice. Essentially it's just like advertising for my own brand. Like, and I mean, that's ultimately what I mean, that's that's just what it's going to be. Right. It's like mm-hmm. bra- you're not trying to get browse, you know, unless you get one of these big contracts, which seem to be so f- few and far in between. It's like you do a browser scene. It's just to say, come to my OnlyFans, come to my right. clip store. And it and gra- that being said, like, it's always like, what what do you want? Like, wh- as a performer, what are your goals? What are my goals? Because, like, I know that there are definitely porn stars out there who they want the big contract like For them, having a career in porn is about, you know, they have a particular goal in mind of what they Mm -hmm. want. Like, maybe they want to win a lot of awards. They want a contract. They want to be, like, incredibly famous and well-known and, like, really leave their mark on the industry. And that's never really been one of my goals. It's I'm always – my attitude has always been like, oh, well, it'd be nice, you know. I wouldn't necessarily turn it down if someone offered me a contract, but I also realize that that doesn't happen by accident. Like people who get contracts work very hard for them. Um, and it's never been a priority of mine. Mm-hmm. Just well, like then- winning awards has never been a priority of mine. I'm just kind of like, I'm going to do whatever I want. <laughs> and if people yeah. like it, cool. Well, I'll get to the return in a second, but like, what are your goals? Or And, and I would also add to that, were your goals different when you started porn versus now? Yeah, I think when I started porn, I didn't actually know what my goals were. I think a lot of it was just like, I wanted to explore and I was very curious to learn more about the industry. And I knew I wanted to make a career of it and to have some longevity. But at when I was brand new, I didn't really know what that meant or what it could or would look like. Um, and now that, you know, I've had years away from the industry and then come back and now, you know, have still have a pretty big loyal fan base 
my goals have definitely shaped up a little more. Like, I think one of my biggest goals is just that I want to continue to like carve out my own niche, right? Like I have, like I said, really loyal fans who... Yeah, they stayed on that Twitter account for a long time. (laughs) They stayed on the Twitter, the Reddit, the subreddit, like, like continued to grow after I retired and... The subreddit was actually one of the things that made me want to come back. When I saw how many people were still subbed to it, I was like, that is wild. Like, I didn't ever expect that. Can can I say, uh, you know, as a Reddit person myself, uh, after you retired, when you would pop up the subs that I tend to check in, uh, mm-hmm. my porn subs, you happen to show up in a lot. So I'd be like, oh, there's Siri. Hope she's doing all right. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> hope she's hope she's finding what she wants to find Pour out some there. For your homie. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I'm gonna just drop a load for this one. No, um, although I, <laughs> although R.I.P. Betty Dotson, I feel like I do need to drop a load I in her know. honor. You know, like we should I all know. come for Betty once today. Come for <laughs> Betty today. <laughs> but so so Siri, uh, you and I both have, I think extremely similar porn career trajectories because mm-hmm. after we shot that um shot that team bj2 uh with sarah J, I i retired from the porn industry it was my debut and my retirement uh <laughs> but i have now like a like a beautiful phoenix uh, re-emerged with an only fans as well uh and, and you uh <laughs> you uh left the industry not long after the that shoot and, you know, what was that about? I, I heard inklings, but I didn't know what to believe or this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, what what happened? Why'd you go? Uh, I mean, to be honest, it was a mix of things. And if I had to boil it down to really, like, one, uh, I could boil it down to two major hey, you don't have to boil it down life. to anything. We got time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd prefer to boil it down because it is a it could potentially be a very long and like convoluted story. So basically, oh, I, as you know, because you met him on the set of Team BJ2, I used to be married. Mm-hmm. And so that was one half of it. And then the other half was well the half of the marriage thing being I was very unhappy in that relationship and mm-hmm. really wanted to leave it but he was very involved in business uh, yeah he was the director in, of in that shoot not the director no, no? he was just oh, like okay. he was assisting with it i mean i i guess you could say the director was a uh, rocker dave like uh you know who does everything with vna and vicky vet like he kind of put it together more um, okay. and then sarah j did a lot of the work organizing it too uh, but, but so, so what was going on with that relationship? How long, how long had y'all been together? Oh, we were together, uh, for three or four years, I want to say, by the time I retired from porn. So we were together since before I started in porn. Um, mm-hmm. but it just wasn't a healthy relationship. It was really like codependent and I was very young when I met him and after being together for as long as we were, and he was also like twice my age, by the way, so that wasn't helpful for me personally. (laughs) Allow me to put on my shocked face. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very good shocked face. I can tell how shocked you are. Um, So shocked. So the age difference ultimately to me became a problem. I'm not sure he ever felt like it was a problem. Probably not. But to me, I was just like, nah, I'm not into this anymore. Like, you know, and it just, yeah, it it was, he was a little manipulative too. Like, you know, and I don't need to go into too much detail there, but It's that's what codependency looks like. You usually have someone who's a little manipulative and it just wasn't great for my mental health. Um, And then feeding into that as well was the fact that, like, I basically hadn't spoken to anyone in my family for three years since I started porn. Like, I was kind of excommunicated from my family and it just left me in a very terrible mental state. And it got to a point where it was so bad that I was, like, suicidal, and I realized I need to v- drastically change my life if I'm going to literally, like, live. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the thing that I knew had to go, the main thing was, like, I need to get out of this relationship. Mm. But, and I actually was really happy with my choice to do porn, and I never felt like porn was a cause of my problems, aside from my family not wanting to talk to me because of porn. But that's just stigmatization. Like, I realized, I was like, I think I can fix that. Like, they just hate Mm. it, but they don't have enough information. Did you tell them that you were getting into porn or did they find out? They found out, which is never a good thing. Anyone, any, when I talk to younger girls now who like think they can hide it, I'm like, bitch, no. Like, 
you have to tell people. Like, they're going to find out in the worst way. And it's so much worse if people just find out through the grapevine. You don't know, know what porn they're... your dad watches. It's like, you don't just get it out the way. <laughs> they didn't, my parents didn't find out like that, fortunately. They found out because, like, someone who knew... Someone who knew one of my friends found out through that grapevine and then told my sister who told my parents. So, it, and, yeah, and, it was a whole thing. Yeah. And, and and what was that phone call like? Uh, my parents assumed that I was being trafficked by my ex. They literally assumed that I was, like, not consenting. They they were like, oh, my God, he's put you on drugs. You're And I, no matter how many times over the years I tried to explain to them, this is something I wanted before I ever mm. met him. Like, this is a choice that I made. Yes, mm. he supports it. And I'm sure that you're confused by him supporting it. But, like, this was entirely my choice in the first place. And my parents never understood that. And I don't think they ever really believed it until I told my mom I was going back into porn. <laughs> There's no one to blame. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. There was no one else to blame. And I think finally it sunk in like, oh, she's very serious about this. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's before, though, you're you're defending that. Like, no, I wasn't trafficked. No, I'm not being manipulated to do this. But you're saying that, right, I'm assuming before you realized that you were in a codependent relationship, right? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, I I didn't. I didn't realize. So do you look back now that you recognize that? Would you look back and still full-throatedly give that defense or would you say that there was some percentage of of him who kind of pushing you in a direction Mm, no i still wouldn't say that like even though even though i'm he was definitely like manipulative in some ways they they weren't really he didn't try to control my porn career like it's kind of it's there's a lot more nuance to it than i think people understand uh, just from hearing, oh, there was a porn star who was in a who was married to someone that, like, they had a a bad relationship. Sure. Usually, the assumption is like, oh, he was controlling everything. He was telling her who to shoot with. Well, that's like, that's was, the story we. That's the story like that. I yeah. even. I mean, I like to think I pay attention at least to the space, and I've got friends in the space, and I, yeah, uh, you know, you listen to this podcast, you read this Twitter thread. It is something that we do hear about. The older boyfriend who starts to kind of micromanage your career, especially yeah. if he had nothing to do with it beforehand. Um, and then all of a sudden, want, you know, so that, that is right. the horror story we hear. And, and so I think, at least for me, you know, I, I come with that question. Usually I have a place of concern at first, mm-hmm. um, not because you can't have agency, but because I know that that does happen. And uh, yeah. and then that's the only like porn set I had like done. So I thought like that was such a cool, awesome experience. And then... In a similar way where you might hear that someone didn't enjoy a sexual encounter the way you did, you go back and be like, oh, fuck, that was there something not on the up and up there. And then it's not just about like tarnishing like your good memory. But now you're like, oh, fuck, was I participating in something, you know, someone didn't want to do. Oh, yeah. And so what's funny is I don't I actually have to give this disclaimer a lot to people (laughs) who I worked like specifically in like mid to late 2014 that was the time when i was probably at my most depressed that i've ever been in my life oh gosh and like going to work like being on set was literally my reprieve from being so depressed about my personal life and not talking to my family and like being in this relationship that i just couldn't fucking stand anymore and i just so it's it's funny because i that like being at work and being on set was like my my happy place Mm -hmm. so it's and and I just say that to again reinforce that like it was never an issue with mm. porn. Like porn was never the problem. In fact, it was a lot of the time the thing that helped me. Um but even then, I, I'm I don't know if like this is pretty commonly said about people who have been through any sort of trauma that you have memory loss associated with trauma and because i had just because i was so depressed and like i was in this relationship that was really emotionally abusive and manipulative um i just don't remember huge chunks of that like six month period like it's wild like i'll i've i've like actually like talked to people who i thought i didn't work with and i was like wait i did work with them oh my god like i just have significant memory loss Oh. And I didn't even smoke weed back then. I do now. But like, <laughs> so I can't even say that it was like stoner, like, you know, foggy brain memory. It was literally just that I was so depressed. My brain wasn't cataloging anything. <laughs> oh, gosh. And I would have thought you would just like forget dicks because there's just too many to keep track of in a long <laughs> enough career. 
Like, nope. I mean, because like, do you outside of that period of time, do you sometimes just like forget your shot with a person? No, not really. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, now that I've been back for about a year, everything I've done in the past year, I have yeah. crystal clear memory of. Okay. <laughs> I, I appreciate the I appreciate you want not wanting people to like think, well, uh, it was a porn relationship. So the porn was the problem because like and I know you have some background in this uh, here and there, but it's like I'm polyamorous. Mm-hmm. And if a relationship ends, they always think it was the poly. But like, right. you know, I the current relationship I'm in almost came to an end during this quarantine. And the only reason would have been because of COVID. Like it was yeah. a pure. So it was like the issues tend to never be at all about the poly part. It's about, mm-hmm. it, we could have not been non-monogamous and this thing still would have been an issue, right? Like that's, yeah. so, and, and, and so exactly. I see a similarity with porn where it's like, I mean, it could be, and there's things mm-hmm. to look out for, but other than that it might be because, you know, the person's selfish or manipulative yeah. or fucking, I don't know, comes on your rug, which apparently I did. <laughs> I'm in big trouble right now. Cause I came on my girlfriend's rug. Um, oh my God. I'm an animal, I guess. I didn't, I don't know. I felt like we've come on other things together. Really? <laughs> Seriously, every every none of the men I've ever shared I've shared this with in the last twenty four hours, uh, none of them seem to understand why this is a big deal. But every woman has said, "Billy can't come on rugs." <laughs> I'm like, okay, sorry. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah, I I don't I don't know. I, I've never had someone come on my rug. I don't know how I'd react. I guess it's, uh, <laughs> it's like which rug in which room. Like that's my question. My thing is like, did I stain it? Because then I'm an asshole. If I didn't stain it, and you just saw a video that I took that I shared, I'm, then I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but okay, so so that time period is is really foggy, and then you kind of come out of the fog. And what's mm-hmm. what's the impetus to you got out of the relationship first and then porn, right? Yeah, so essentially they were so closely intertwined because my ex was, like, essentially my assistant. Like, mm-hmm. he, for the last two years or so that I was doing porn, he didn't actually work full-time anywhere. Like, I was making enough to support us both, and honestly, I needed the help. Like, I was overwhelmed a lot of the time with fan interactions and, like, email responses, and, like, and I was representing myself, and I didn't have an agent, so, like, I needed help with responding to booking requests, and so he did a lot for me and with me and was like essentially a part of the business. Mm -hmm. Um, So because he was so wrapped up in all that, like I literally couldn't see, I was like this, the relationship itself is codependent. Like he's everywhere in my, he's, I live with him. We're together in a relationship. Like I work with him basically. Like he's uh, almost one half of the business that I'm running currently. And like, I don't even have, I didn't have close personal friends. Like I didn't ever get Mm -hmm. super close to anyone that I met in porn. So all of, I only had like two or three friends that lived back in Texas that I never got to see ever. And my whole family didn't talk to me. So he was the only person in my life for like three years. Mm -hmm. That's my garage downstairs opening up. Probably my neighbor. So that's a very loud sound. Sorry. And yeah, no, I'm sorry to hear that that was like what, you know, that's what it was. I I, I heard the first inkling of that and was like, and that made me sad because, you know, you seem like a very bright, happy, chipper lady mm-hmm. <laughs> when I met well, you. It's... You were you were quite good at hiding the, the sadness. Yeah, I've always been very good at hiding. Um, masking is, you know, what my therapist called it. She was like, you're so good at masking because I remember when I started going to a therapist and it was very expensive and I was paying Basically a couple thousand dollars a month to see this woman two times a week. And I did that for about two months or so before I even got into the fact that I was depressed. Like I literally just went to a therapist twice a week for a couple months paying a ton of money to sit there and be like, yeah, here's what I did today. Here's what I ate for breakfast. Life is great. And just pretend nothing was wrong because I was that uh, dissociated, essentially, Mm -hmm. from myself. And how did it feel to to break free of that relationship? Oh, fantastic. It yeah. was like a, a huge weight being lifted from me. And so, yeah, to get back, because you had asked, like, you know, that I left the relationship and then left porn. And they kind of happened con- congruously, at, mm-hmm. like, basically at the same time. Um, I had decided I was going to leave that, like, you know, asked for a divorce in December of 2014. And that is also when I moved to Kentucky. And then, like, I didn't actually announce immediately that I was retiring from porn because 
I just, I knew that I had a bunch of scenes that had been filmed that hadn't yet released, and I thought it would just confuse everyone. So I was like, I'm just going to wait until everything that I know was on the books, like, actually rolls out, and then I will formally say that I'm retiring. And that ended up being, like, February 2015 or something. Mm -hmm. Um, But by the time I actually said I was retired, I had, in effect, literally been retired and living totally far away from L.A. and, like, not doing anything for several months. Mm -hmm. And and why Kentucky? Because that's not, because it's not like you're from there, so is that... Why why go there? Um, that's oh, actually that's a great question that I won't answer. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you for taking care of yourself. I love it when I ask a question. Someone says I'd rather not. So you're so you're in Kentucky. What I will say is I really like it here. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> I don't I like, plan on leaving anytime soon. All right. All right. And what what spawned you coming back? Because you were gone for like five years, five almost five years. years. Yeah. Like I was gone longer than I was ever in it. Hmm. Yeah, so that's wild. Um, and it didn't feel like it was longer, because I guess time, when you're working in porn, because it consumes so much of your life, it feels like time moves differently. And it felt like I was in the industry for a lot longer than three years. Um, so by the I remember having, a, like, when I hit that over three-year mark of having left the porn industry, I remember having, like, one of those on this day throwback things on my iPhone and being like, holy shit, I've been out of porn longer than I was ever in it. And that feels weird because that was a very formative part of my life. Yeah. And you weren't doing, were you doing, during that off time, were you still doing like an OnlyFans type nope. stuff or nothing? I mean, I everything was shut completely down. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, there was still, for a while there remained a Twitter account that I didn't run. And it even said that like in the bio, like obviously I don't run it. Um, but essentially it just fell to my former webmasters. Um, so VNA, mm-hmm. like Vicky vet and her company, because they ran my website um, sure. back when I had that. Were you so, ever tempted to just be like, oh, I could do a little camming, just a little here. Nope. And the- no, no, I was very final. I was like, when I decided I was going to retire, I was like, this is for life. This is, I am completely done with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, so I was, and I was so far removed from it, and I was working like a regular, like a civilian job, you know, and and quite happy, honestly. Like, mm. so it it was easy for me to be like, nah, I'm done with that. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's also how you were able to find the happiness outside. I was because part of me was thinking, was like, well, what, what, what do you do during that time? Like, what you pick up some hobbies? Like, you know, you said you worked a civilian job, and just what, what's kind of life like? Knowing this world, I mean, it's such a drastic shift. It's not like you Mm -hmm. left a career in banking and then just went to go, you know, do something else. Like, I mean, you left a very public facing sexual job. And so what's that like to one, not be in it? Because it's kind of crazy. It's a crazy lifestyle similar with comedy. It's there's a lot going on all the time Mm -hmm. Uh, to find like, like, was it calmer? Was it a calmer way to live? It was like a hit or reset button because Some of the, like, there are some issues that I had with, so here's the issues that I did have with my porn career before Mm. I left. I felt like I wasn't actually accurately representing myself for a long time. Mm. So, and that's kind of weird, I think, for my fans to hear because a lot of my fan base really misses the, like, first year series where I had the blonde hair and I was a little bit heavier and, like... Mm. The, they love that version of me, but what I like, uh, I think a lot of fans don't understand, and maybe they don't care, and that's fine. They don't have to. Um, that wasn't that. That was a very mm, like, what's the word? I can't think of the damn word I want right now. But it was a very like. It did, it, I don't fe- when I looked in the mirror at that point in my life, I felt like I'm dressing up like a porn star. I mm-hmm. felt like this is now I normally look like the the bleach blonde hair, the stupid bob haircut. Every time I went to a set, half the time the director would see my hair and be like, "Oh, we have to give you the Marilyn Monroe treatment," and they would curl my hair, and I was like, "I fucking hate this." It's like, so hacky. <laughs> So hacky. Because I I had literally one year before I started porn, I was Mm. in college with a, like, dating a woman looking like a straight up, like, baby butch. Like, I Mm. am, and and I don't know, and I always harped on about how I'm bi, I'm bi, but, like, the porn industry (laughs) just kind of, like made me feel like I have to I have to find a brand like I have to look a certain way and I have to like fulfill this this very like male gaze fantasy so right you could, you could you could you could you couldn't look the way that you looked and be like a queer porn star in a way 
Yeah, and I guess that's kind of where my ex's influence did come in, because originally when I said I wanted to do porn, what I specifically wanted to do was just shoot for, like, Crash Pad series and be a queer porn star. I love I I like, I love I Crash to do. Pad series. I think yeah. it's so cool. Yeah. It's so and, fun. <laughs> <laughs> so but my ex was like he was like I think you're shooting too low. Like I think you could honestly be a really really like well-known famous porn star if you wanted to be. Like you're gorgeous. You you have all of this potential. Like if you're gonna do it, mm. why not just like do it? You know? And so he kind of did change my goals in that way. Like he got to me a little bit, but I don't fault him for like I don't necessarily think that was a bad thing. Like yeah, I'm you're still... encouraging. You're saying, ah, oh, if you want to be the, you know, you we assume everybody wants to right. be at it. We all right. assume that the top looks the same for everybody, right? And yeah. so, so yeah, I don't have a problem with that. It's just that I in in 2012 when I started in porn, and especially because when I started out, I went to an agent, which was LA Direct Models or Derek Hay, whatever you want to call him, um, who's a terrible human being, uh, <laughs> but. It was kind of like starting in the way that I did and like having this agent didn't really give me any room to like explore my appearance or like create like a quote unquote brand as a porn star that more closely fit what I feel like I actually am. Mm -hmm. So that's why my appearance changed so much over three years. I was trying to find what I felt like reflected who I actually am. And I got pretty close to it. You know, that's why I did the bright, the bright red hair. I was Mm -hmm. trying to like kind of kill the original Siri. I was like, I don't like this. This is not me. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think you're, I mean, do you think you're embracing that now? Do you feel like you are yourself when you're on screen? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and and I, that's why I, I actually just tweeted something earlier today about it because I was like re- going through and responding to some Reddit comments and I get a little salty when I see so many guys being like, oh, I miss the, I miss your boobs before reduction. And Salty in a way that, like, I don't care. <laughs> How dare you have your and, body and different I, than you want to? Yeah. How dare it's, you? <laughs> it's kind of just like, so I tweeted something about it, and I get a lot of responses that are like, oh, don't let them get to you. You're still beautiful. And I'm like, yes, I know. They're not getting to me. They're, like, annoying. They're just, <laughs> it's like, I guess I just don't understand the, like, being upset that someone changed their appearance. Like, are you going to be upset that I don't look 24 when I'm 32? Like, Shut the I, fuck up. And, and, and <laughs> even if you want to be upset about it, I I think you can be upset about a lot of things to air that that discontent and then at the person, uh, you know, well, what, what what do you hope to accomplish I there? Oh, yeah, the- I'll go. I'll go dye my hair blonde again. Sure. Because you <laughs> right. avatar, Let egg, egg avatar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like- just for you because you wanted it. <laughs> there's there's a when it comes to the comments about the breast reduction. I'm just going to rant for a second here because I'm actually like. Do you, want to set, I, do you want to set people up that you had a breast reduction? Oh, yeah. I had yeah. breast reduction surgery in 2016. So, like, mm-hmm. a, about exactly a year after I retired mm-hmm. from porn. Um, and I don't want to go into all the detail about, like, people always ask, like, why did you do it? It's like, because I wanted to. And I always wanted to. And I don't know why that's hard for – sometimes people find that so unbelievable. But, no, I wanted to do it since I was 16. I just needed to get to a place where I was, like, ready for it. Mm-hmm. So I had it done several years ago. And there's so many, there are comments that I see that I like find hilarious. Like probably one of the top ones is like, what a terrible surgeon. He really botched the job. <laughs> and yeah, no, I see some really mean stuff. And, and I What's just, crazy is a lot of them want to fuck the porn stars that they're talking to. And then course, like, yeah. even though it's this unattainable thing, unless they, they escort on the sides, it's like, what I'm makes. I'm a mod on my own subreddit. <laughs> so like they. They don't realize that I am the one filtering the comments that they're leaving about me. They think that they are just commenting to some other bros. And I'm like, no, I'm literally the one that sees this first dude. Like, delete comment. But it's like these same dudes will say it to like women on Tinder. And then I'm like, what what part of this makes you think they'll fuck you because you said like, why do you think this is going to help what you think you could uh, achieve? It's like, let let just, I don't know. I, it always astonishes me when I see like screenshots of like, Oh, you look really great. You should lose like this. Or, Oh, you look great. You should dye your hair this though. And I'm like, what, what makes you think she wants to fuck you now? Yeah. (laughs) Look, my, I've started to say that I'm just going to Steve jobs this shit because I don't care what porn fans think they want because they all think they want either the same thing that they've always seen or something that's completely different than what that person actually is. Like it's, it never really reflects 
the truth of like who a person is. So like when I see these comments about dudes being like, I wish you had blonde hair. Like, I'm mad that you got breast reduction surgery. I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm going <laughs> to do whatever I want to do. And whoever wants to see it will come find it and they will mm-hmm. like it. And if you do not want to see it, there are literally thousands of other porn stars out there who mm-hmm. have big natural tits who haven't had breast reduction surgery and never will because they're happy with their big natural tits. I'm not your girl. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm not trying to be your girl. <laughs> I don't <laughs> and, know why and so, it's so hard. And I don't want to ask like what's the brand now as much as like who is Siri now because it sounds like you want to try to overlap it to something more authentic. Uh which by yeah. which I mean as a small side note. So during the team BJ there was like you and Sarah J and Sarah J mm-hmm. great hot does great porn work and everything but like you had a very much more authentic vibe to you like Mm -hmm. you look like someone i could meet at the bar and possibly have gotten a blowjob from and i was like yeah (laughs) i want to go with that one who needs the porn star fancy give me the fancy of someone being interested in me that's that's the one i like (laughs) that's my favorite of being desirable (laughs) (laughs) so so but like so it seems sounds like so what is like who is siri who is siri now uh, well, I'm, st- I mean, I'm just me. Like I haven't, my personality is still literally the same that it's always been. I think a huge difference, um, in, in as far as like for, for the purpose of like branding right. myself as a porn star is the fact that I've been super, um, a, like a big proponent of powerlifting now. And I've started like sharing powerlifting videos on my Instagram and stuff. And I think that's really cool. And it's also fantastic for marketing because there's a huge, like, there's a massive overlap of people who are power lifters who watch a lot of porn because a lot of the time it tends to be men between like 20 and 40. Mm. <laughs> you also fall in that spot of like the power lifters, but they don't want the woman who's like shredded, shredded. Like the yeah, one who has like, like a, the 18 like a thick pa- girl who's like strong, strong or strong as I like to say. Um, but you know, like someone who could curves. deadlift yeah. me. <laughs> like that's how yeah. much do you weigh? Oh, that's a personal question where, you know, I haven't had carbs today for a reason. Well, if you weigh less than 264 pounds, yes, I could deadlift you. Solid. Yes. I'm pretty (laughs) sure you weigh less than 264 pounds. So far, yes. Quarantine did a number, (laughs) but, you know, we're working on it. It's fine. You know what? I think we're all in the boat together. So So what were the the steps to getting back in? When when, when did you first think, I I think I want back into that world? Uh, It was... Trying to think of when I had the the real inkling. So going back to like the summer of 2018, I had been in a long term relationship and it ended kind of messily and it was really rough. And I was like, I don't want to date anyone for a while. Like, because I'd been a little bit of a serial monogamist for like a couple years after I moved out here. Um, and th- that didn't feel like it was right for me. Like, it took me a while to learn that. But I was like, why am I trying to like be monogamous with? these guys that I don't even really like, like that much. This is weird. Um, so I had a period where I was like, I'm just going to be single. I'm just going to do me. And I just need to like, really like sit down and think about my goals and what I want to do. And I realized I had so much to say and that I wanted to really like almost vent about my experiences in porn. Um, basically in a way to, because I like a lot of my, friends in my personal life would ask me questions about it all the time. Cause I, I've always been open with people like, this is what I used to do. Like, you know, especially with like men that I dated, I would like tell them immediately. Uh, and how, I found how that, many, like, wh- how many said, I know. Did, did uh, anyone like, like, did anyone know already? No one. No. Yeah. They would know. And then they would lie and say they didn't know. Cause they <laughs> thought that I would think they're a pervert for watching porn. I'm like, <laughs> I literally, I made the porn. Why would I think you're a pervert for watching the porn, you fucking weirdo? You probably paid for this dinner in a way. So, why- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it was, I was, I was just single for a while. So I didn't like have a guy that I was dating who I was trying to like appease by like not talking too much or like reminiscing about having done porn. Cause, just like you do, like, you'd be like, ah, this one time, like, at my job a couple years ago, like, let me tell you this funny story. And, like, I couldn't do that because if I, like, the guy I was dating would be like, oh, I'm uncomfortable now. Like, you just reminded me that you used to do porn. And I'm like, that was, that was, like, a year ago that I did that. And it was a huge part of my life. Like, you can't ask me to pretend it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. So I had all this, sh- like, I just wanted to vent it. And that's why I started my podcast. 
after mm-hmm. adult. And so originally when I started my podcast, it was literally just me in my bedroom being like, I'm just going to very awkwardly tell some stories about porn. And I was doing it anonymously. Um, but I only sent the links for the podcast to like my personal friends. I didn't ever intend to have a podcast that I actually like put effort into. It was like, I'm just going to do a couple episodes and like tell these stories because people in my real life are interested and they always ask me about it. And here's a way I can just be completely uncensored and let it all out. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed fucking doing the podcast so much. And it was really nice to give myself an outlet to talk about uh, my experiences in a way that I knew I wasn't being judged, right? Because I was Mm. more that I wasn't judging myself in a way. So I know it's kind of weird to hear, but like one of the things that I definitely did uh, when I retired from porn was like, I did allow other people's judgments to get to me a little bit. Like Mm. I started to feel kind of guilty about having done porn and that felt weird. And it Mm. definitely caused some like conflicting feelings within me. Has that not, has that faded away now? Yeah, right now? it has. And why, it has, why do you- and it was never truly how I felt. It was just that when people just project their s- stigma and their judgments onto you, it's very, it's very hard to kind of let that bounce off. Mm-hmm. What, what, how do you think you got over that? Uh, that well, concern? by doing my podcast for sure. sure. And but that's kind of one of the, yeah, that's one of the re- main reasons I wanted to do it was to just own it and be like, Hey, I did this. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to tell the stories about it and my experiences. And if you don't like it, then fuck off and you don't have to listen to it. And you don't have to be my friend because I don't care. I don't want someone who dislikes that part of my life to be my friend. Like, so yeah, that, that, that's why I thought that would have been like a deal breaker or almost like a filtration system for yeah. dating is like, let them know that you did porn. They react poorly. Mm-hmm. You never wanted to date them in the first place. That's exactly that's what, which is yeah. why I would always tell, if I dated someone, I would tell them immediately, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was usually a fairly good filter. Um, but I did the podcast for, like, nine months. Uh, and then in, in that nine months, you know, my co-host Rachel came on board. She's, like, one of my best friends. And so she started doing it with me. And it was just super fun. And we were getting super into it. And it was after, an, uh, like, nine months of doing the podcast and just be- feeling like I have an avenue to be open and talk about these things. And it wasn't just reminiscing about porn. It was, like, discussing things that are very blatantly sexual in like a public way and feeling comfortable doing that. And that is one of the biggest things that I missed about porn is what I started to realize. So it was just through doing my podcast that I was like, man, I really miss this. Like I actually miss the industry and I've pretended or I haven't allowed myself to feel that feeling of missing it because I've honestly just wanted to like please my family because they hated that I did it so much. (laughs) Yeah. And what what were like the steps to getting back in? Like, do you have to you got to call somebody be like, can I get that password? Hey, I just, this I just made an OnlyFans. I made a private Snapchat and then I made an OnlyFans hmm. and I posted on the subreddit, the Siri porn star subreddit. Like, hey, it's actually me. Like I did like a verification photo, but I like <laughs> I posted on there and I was like, hi, I've resurfaced. And of course, instantly they all like shat their pants. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> And then I made, you know, and then I ventured into making an Instagram and a Twitter again. And so I just really started on social media and like doing OnlyFans and stuff. And then I was doing that for six months. So because that was like in June, it was actually on my birthday. Uh, It was my 31st. Right? Yeah, my 31st birthday, June 2019 was when I did that. And so six months later in January 2020 was when I went out. And shot for Brazzers and then did the AVN Awards and everything. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was it was a it was a quick six months. It was wild. Yeah. And is has has your return like has there been is it been a, a notable thing or does it just feel like yep, back at that job, back back doing the regular thing? Um it feels different in like the best way, uh, but in some ways it is a little bit the same. Like, so th- kind of like the daily grind of being a content creator hasn't changed much. It's very similar to what I used to do back in 2014 before I retired. It's like I wake up and I have, I basically just wade through all my DMs and like emails every day. So in 2014, though, I was not an OnlyFans, so that part was different. Sure. It was almost like all my fan interactions were in email form and like, you know, I was doing like a lot of custom video requests and stuff yeah. back then. And these days it's more 
almost entirely of like only fans based. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like as soon as we get off this interview, I'm gonna go look at my own because I gave away like free trials to my only fans all weekend. So I got so many new subscribers that my inbox has blown up with like 300 unread ah. messages. So that'll be fun. <laughs> And, and how has the work on yourself been? Like, what you know, how, how where are you now compared to then? Is there anything you still feel like you got to work on? Is the codependency still an issue? No, it's like the opposite. It's so funny. Like, I he's codependent partner, on you. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's like it's the opposite, and like very not codependent at all. Which is what I want, and I don't think I'm not naturally a person who would default to be codependent on someone in a relationship. It's just that my first. My first really, really long-term serious relationship was with that ex Mm -hmm. who was – he had codependency issues. I didn't even know what that was when I met him. And he actually did tell me at one point. He was like – he used to be like Codependence Anonymous or something. Like like he actually like realized that it was a thing that he did. But even realizing that he still was doing it with me. And like I just didn't – I didn't know enough or I didn't know the signs, you know. And also I think just with an age gap that large, like – there's kind of a default setting where like the person who's older, especially an older man has more power. Like even if he's not trying to take that power, it kind I would just found myself naturally sort of deferring to him in a way that I was like, I don't like this. This doesn't feel right, but I don't know how to like, not, I don't know how to not do this. And also I don't even really love you. Like this relationship <laughs> needs to end. <laughs> but, uh, and the yeah. and the battles with depression that's been uh, that's been making progress. Yeah, I I'm always I've actually talked about this publicly on uh, like the podcast and and other things too about that I'm a huge proponent for like therapy medication. Like I've actually been on antidepressants since I was 16. So the fact that I was super depressed in 2014 is like nothing new to me. It's just that that was probably the worst it had ever been. But I don't actually remember a time in my life since puberty when I haven't felt depression. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's genetic, honestly. It, it truly is. Like, my my dad has battled with uh, mental illness, like, his whole life. Um, it's on both sides of my family. There's just a lot of, a lot of uh, depression, anxiety, you know. We got some other more serious mm-hmm. stuff on some sides of the family, too. So it's... I've always accepted that. I'm like, okay, it's fine. It doesn't mean that I can't be super happy and like enjoy my life. But I am on an anti, like I take an SSRI antidepressant every day. And it took me a really long, t- like, and I'm saying like over 10 years to find a medication that actually worked for me. But I finally found one and I'm like, this is the fucking bomb. Like I take it every day. It doesn't, I don't get any weird side effects. You know, it's nice. That's great. And and where where's uh where are things at with the family now? Uh back to normal. As normal yeah? as they'll ever get, I suppose. Yeah. I'm actually really close with my mom. I'm like closer with my mom than I ever have been in my life, and it's mm-hmm. fantastic. And like we just text each other little stupid memes all day. Like, it's great. <laughs> and she was pissed when I told her I was going back into porn. Pissed. Yeah. With like all caps. Mm-hmm. She was so fucking disappointed. And I felt it felt awful disappointing her but i'm also like i can't make my life choices just to please you when we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things especially not this issue you know and i still i made it clear to my parents i was like my big thing with with going back into this field is i need you guys to know that i'm an adult and i am capable of making my own decisions and I am safe. Like, it, this is, I. you guys don't understand what porn is like. I think you. they have this idea. It's like boomers, right? They have this idea that everyone in porn is, like, just disease-ridden. And, like, oh, God, it's just a free-for-all. And everyone's, like, snorting lines of cocaine off each other all the time. I'm sure there are some porn sets that function that way. Mm-hmm. None that I've been on, specifically. But, like, we have a testing system. It's pretty fucking effective. Like, I've... Never had any major issues with that. Never had any major health concerns. Like, I know how to protect myself. I know my body. I respect my body. So I had to, like, give my parents this whole speech about, like, don't worry about that. Right? Like, if you There's other things to worry about, but, like, that one's on That's not the one. That's not the one. Worry about other shit. But I just had to tell that. I was like, if you need to promise me that if you have a specific concern or if you see or hear something about the porn industry that you don't understand that makes you worry for me, 
you need to come to me and you need to ask me about it. Mm -hmm. I can give you resources. Please do not Google what to do if your kid is in porn. I... Like, you're just going to find these predatory fucking, like, weird Christian anti-porn organizations that basically spout bullshit. And, mm-hmm. like, which I'm pretty sure is what my mom did way back in 2012, and that's why she thought I was being trafficked. Like, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> you- I had to give them a whole speech, and they were, like, disappointed, but it just came down to them being, like, you know what? I don't, I think specifically what my mom said was, like, I don't understand it. Or, no, she was, like, I don't like it. <laughs> Uh, and I definitely don't support it, but I will try to understand it. I will try to understand why this is your choice. And that's the best I can do. And I was like, that is massive progress. Thank you very much. I think it makes a big difference that I'm an adult now and I've been living on my fucking own for a mm-hmm. long time. <laughs> yeah. And they know that. So it's just like, you know. Yeah. And because the, the porn interest, I mean, they're, the, the, the porn quote unquote issue especially back then when you were like in your mid twenties is like, it's being compounded by that overall parental concern of just you being able to provide for yourself and being, yeah. ner- you know, t- telling your parents you do, you're pursuing comedy for a living is not uh, usually considered uh, this like <laughs> fully supported decision. Right. But Cause they- they're like, they're like, you're so young. What are you doing? Like, that's not going to give you a future. That's, you know, that was a huge concern. They were like, my mom actually still, she said something to me. She was like, she was like, but you're you're in your 30s. Uh, what are you going to do when you're over 40? No one wants to see that. And I was like, mom, if uh, you think people don't want to see people over 40 doing porn, then you don't know what you're talking about, woman. Like, <laughs> I am waiting. For, I, mean, I, I sit in front of a framed poster of Susan Sarandon every day. Don't you dare tell me over 40 Susan is nothing. Susan Sarandon is hot as fuck. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, there are so many porn stars who are... Over 40, pushing 40, <laughs> in, their, in their late 30s, doing fucking phenomenal. You got Nina Hartley I, I out there being a Joanna perennial Angel goddess. Is, but I think she's probably about 40. And like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, look at Joanne Angel. Yeah, yeah. Nina Hartley. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> but, so I'm not worried about the age thing. Like, fuck that. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but, but, but it seems like they've seen the light to accept their daughter, who she is, and that from that she's happy unless you're masking right now in which case great job (laughs) no yeah it's i think it makes a massive difference for them to see me they've actually seen it like the proof is in the pudding right or whatever that saying is they see me on a regular basis functioning better than i have in a long time because i'm Mm -hmm. like actually finally feel like my life is put together in a way that i wake up and i'm like excited about what i do for a living and i'm excited about who i surround myself with and it's kind of like all the pieces slowly falling into place. Mm-hmm. And it took a very long time. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you're getting there. And, and like I said, you, you seem very happy. And uh, I'm happy about that. I always prefer when peop- when porn stars are happier than not. Uh, yeah, isn't that great? No, Yeah, no one wants to like know that how depressed you are and then like uh, jerk off to it later. Because then you have to do some Speaking double thing. Speaking which, feel free to watch <laughs> Team BJ2 and jerk off to it. Because even though, oh. like I said, I was very depressed at that point in my life. But when I was on set, I was like, yes, I can forget about all that. Like, just give me dick. <laughs> it was, it, it, I told you in the email, the second, I think the second most common question I get besides how do I find a sex positive therapist is men and women going, how do I get the team beat the porn that you did with Siri? How do I get that? I love it. And I just want to be like, it's not that the the it's not that impressive. I I as in I'm not that impressive. It, everybody, it's it's great great video though. But <laughs> although I I tried to make it work on stage, and one day I'm gonna figure out. But there's a moment when I stepped up to you, um, mm-hmm. you put your hands on my chest, and then you look up, and it's in the DVD, which I don't know why they cut they don't cut this, but they you just go like, ooh, you smell nice, and then I beamed and went, oh, thank you, and uh, in the nerdiest fucking. Really ah! sexy. I was like, I must have killed boners at that moment when people get there. But if you really need to see it, everybody, okay. Um, <laughs> but yes, no, uh, a very fond memory. Also, also, I re- uh, another fun one was afterwards when y'all are giving out the DVDs. And I, it's not that like I'm not a fan or something. It's not like I don't enjoy what y'all do. But it's like I wasn't familiar with the two of y'all before I had started putting um together an interview request with sarah J. and Mm -hmm. before so while the uh world cup tournament was still going on and 
afterward, so every, I'm surrounded by people who are like fans of you or Sarah or both, like diehard yeah. fans. And we got to the end of the line, and you, and you had one DVD left uh, of yours. And there was this kid f- from Texas who drove out to Vegas. He drove like eight hours to do this thing. He was, was like the 19. the guy who had just turned 18? Y- yeah, or, or yeah. Maybe he was 21, but he had just like had a, he's like, this is my birthday present or something. He was like, a fucking baby. And, and he was a literal <laughs> child. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> you, I had the last DVD in my hand you just gave me. And I was like, no, nah, dude, you, you need this. You committed. <laughs> You have this. Man. I want you to have. That. That's so nice. Um, but yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much for chatting with me. Um, quick question: Do you have like an extra maybe 10, 15 minutes for a bonus episode? I understand if you don't. Absolutely. All right. So Patreon people, you can hear that tomorrow. Uh, but for now, uh, Siri, where can people find you? Where can they find your podcast? Plug you can away. Find me on SiriDoll.com. Siri. D-A-H-L is how doll is spelled, SiriDoll.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on social media, I'm the real Siri dot PS on Instagram and the real Siri PS on Twitter. And I also do my podcast, which is After Adult. You can find it anywhere you get your podcast or just go to AfterAdult.com. Uh, and if you're a Redditor uh, like me, yeah, check out the subreddit. It's it's <laughs> quite good. <laughs> the subreddit uh, is our Siri porn star. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, uh, Siri, th- thanks so much for chatting. Why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody? Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Oh, how fun was that? I'm glad Siri's back in the scene and, and on her own terms. And of course, if you want to see our scene together, you're going to have to uh, you know, go out and get Team BJ2 and figure out which white guy I was. Uh, you Oh, you want to see some more of me? You, you like seeing me get my dick sucked? How about on my OnlyFans? Two nights ago, I posted a video of me at my at-home glory hole with one of my uh, one of my visitors. That was pretty hot, so you can go pay to get that if you're feeling horny for Billy at OnlyFans.com slash CallMeBilly. But if you want to tell us what you thought about this week's episode, you know... The best way to do it is to shout it out on the social media. That's the way, that's how we know how you're vibing, what you're digging, what you're not digging. Shoot us some tags. I'm on Twitter at the Billy Presida. I'm on Instagram at Billy is Presida. You got to spell that whole sucker out because I am Shadow Band. Uh, and you can get yourself some man whore merch and sex positive meme action when you smash the like button on the Man Whore Podcast Facebook fan page. And if you want to send me something longer, you want to send me a little bit more in-depth comment, question, criticism. If you send me your nudes, please cash at me first. You can send it all over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. Tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to be having our monthly manwhore munch with all of my $7 and up fan whores on Patreon. So if you want to join us for that, we're going to be talking about our long-lost loves and lovers, those ones who got away. Oh, I can't wait to hear everybody's stories. And you can join us at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash podcast. Oh, I'm so glad we got to talk to Siri. I got I got to show her that she's on my wall. And, and I got to thank her for sucking my dick. It was great. Please don't travel for Thanksgiving if you really don't have to. And when you think to yourself that you have to, ask yourself like, Yeah, but like, do I have to have to? You probably don't. Let's try to stop the spread and let's stay slutty. The Man War Podcast is sponsored by HotMovies.com. Try out some ethical paid-for porn for free with none of those hidden fees or secret subscriptions when you sign up at hotmovies.com and use the promo code MANHOR.